All right. What's going on, fellas? See, I came, uh, I was up here just a, a little while ago when, you, when we were all eating, getting our grub on, right? And um, I came behind this thing. I was like, oh, man, the people in the front row can't see me. <laughs> no, nah, it's all good. In case somebody starts throwing something, I can hide behind this thing. You know what I mean? It's all good. Praise the Lord. Well, hey, fellas, man, um, what, a, what a great, great evening tonight just to break bread and to hang out with one another and, and to just build on our relationships that we already have and develop new friendships and relationships with other men. You know, I think this is something that's so important within the body of Christ, within the church, is for men to, to uh, make themselves vulnerable to other men through their friendships. You know, um, back in the world, back in the day, you know, we had our friendships and our homies and whatever you wanted to call it, right? But um, we, we kept our cards close, you know what I mean? We, we, uh, we had our, our borders of how close we would allow people to get. And I think, when, well, and I, and I, don't, I don't think, I know this, that when, when, uh, when God delivers us from the, from the grip and the bondage of sin, all that stuff goes away. And all of a sudden, it's just like you want to you wanna have a friendship, like a real authentic friendship, a friendship like how what's talked about in the Bible with, with uh, King David and Jonathan, you know, that kind of a close-knit, loving relationship where I can say, man, I love that man right there. You know, and I know in the world that will sound weird, right? Right? Like, what? Trip out on this. I went to go do a, some prison ministry not too long ago. And it was probably about maybe seven years ago. We're, at, uh, we're doing this prison yard event and everything. And that's a whole another cool story about my life. But um, I was like, how am I going to get these guys' attention? You know, because we're on the yard. And so I remember I got behind the microphone. They did all the music. And then I just said, hey, what's up? I introduced myself. My name's Tommy. And, and I said, my name's Tommy. And, and, and I'm in love with a man. I got their attention, you know, but I went on to talk about the man, Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let me pray. Father, Lord, as we are gathered here tonight, Lord, um, as men, what we desire to do, Lord, is to hear from your word. Clearly, we want to grow in your word. And Father, we want to, Lord, just receive so that not so that we can only have head knowledge, but Lord, that we would be able to be receptive of everything that you have so that we can go back to our homes with our wives, our children, our workplace, our friendships, wherever it might be, Lord, and, and make a difference because of the work that you're doing in and through us. We love you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, it is so important that men get together within the church. You know, I, I, I say this all the time when I want to get when I get together with men's groups and uh, at the church, wherever it's at, is that I, I, I believe this as the men go in the church. OK, listen, as the men go in the church, so goes the church. You know, when there's a strong group of men that are just loving God, you know, you can walk away and say, you know what, that's a strong church right there. And it's so wonderful to see so many men from Morningstar Christian Chapel here uh, just wanting to serve God. And it's a, it's a cool thing. And, you know, um, singing one of those songs that we were singing, um, uh, you are my re you're, I, you're my rescuer. Or how's it go? I'm not a worship guy, so I, I forget the lyrics. You know, uh, you are, you know, you're my rescue. You know, and it's like how many of us back in the day would cry out for someone to help us? You know what I mean? And here we are as a group of men. Lord, you're my rescuer. You're my everything. You're my savior. And that's exactly who it is, right? And what a great thing. Well, let's open up our Bibles tonight. Guys, let's dig into God's word, right? We already digged into some food with our fingers. It's all good, right? Someone back there was saying, yeah, the best part of this is doing the dishes, you know, ain't no dishes. Just wrap it up in a plastic bag and throw it away. It's all good. John chapter 15, the gospel of John chapter number 15 is where we're going to be at. And every time I read this chapter, John chapter 15, uh, I'm reminded of when I first got saved. And uh, I, I remember I went and I was like, where, where do I start reading the Bible? You know, I was in a men's home and um, I, I had just recently got saved and I was, you know, interested in the, the things of the Bible, in the things of God. And I was like, where do I start to read? I don't know. And so I was encouraged, hey, start reading through, um, through the Gospel of John and in particular, focus on chapter number 15. And so I did. And I kind of, you know, 
being a brand new Christian, you're really not understanding, you know, what's going on. But I, I got the idea, you know, especially when you get to chapter number 15, abide and, you know, stay connected. You want to stay close to the connection, right? And so for me, and I'll tell you why this kind of made sense for me, uh, so young in my faith is because I wanted to stay close to the connection when I was in the world. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, praise God. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. That's all good. Okay. Someone starts laughing. Um, see, when I say stay close to the connection is because when you're, you know, using drugs, I was a, a, you know, drug addict and everything using drugs. And I always wanted to stay close. I wanted to know where the connection was so I can always have, you know, that, that supply of drugs, you know, easy, easy access to it. And here in this gospel, in chapter number 15 of John, you know, I think, you know, Jesus says he's speaking to his disciples. And this is like a, a second part of the upper room discourse. You guys, back in chapter number 13 of the gospel of John, Jesus actually begins this discourse with his disciples when he knows he's actually getting ready to go and be crucified, to be arrested OK, uh, to be betrayed and to be beaten and everything. And so what Jesus does is he has this last supper. Right. We all know what that you know, maybe you, you grew up in, a, in your home and you had that picture up on your wall of that last supper, you know, when you had all the guys, you know, sitting there and Jesus is in the middle, you know, and they're all kind of just like had that weird look on their face. You know, and there was always that one guy that looked ugly. You know, he's like, that's the bad guy. That's the betrayer. That's Judas. Right. Well, um, so Jesus is having this last supper there with the disciples, you know, and he washes their feet. And chapter number 15 kind of has a transition to this discourse because he's speaking specifically just to his disciples. And here, as he starts off, we're not going to read the whole chapter. The chapter is very rich. And I would encourage you guys to read the whole chapter, actually go through the whole discourse um, there in, uh, in the Gospel of John when Jesus is just having this moment with his, his disciples, right? But let me start right here. Verse number one, chapter 15, and it says this, Jesus speaking, he says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, it takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You see, there's a theme here already. Abide, 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 right? Look at verse number five. I am the vine. Jesus saying this, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Guys, if you have your pen right now, please underline that part of, the, of, of verse number five. Without me, when Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. That's something that you should have underlined in your Bible to always remind yourself when you go through this to, to say, man, without Jesus, I can't do anything. Without God, I can't. And we're going to look at what that means right now in just a second. But look at these verses here. In verses 1 through 3, you know, the vine and the branch, this, this, this connection, this abiding, it it's pictures a constant connection, right? A constant connection or, or a dependence, right? Because that branch can't produce anything if it's not connected to the tree, right? Or that branch can't do produce any fruit unless it's connected to the vine. You see, now this is something very picturesque for the children of Israel. Because the children of Israel, you know, Israel was seen as this, as the, the fruit and the vine and everything, right? And their fruitfulness. And so this would kind of was hitting home, if you will, for, um, for, the, you know, for the disciples that were there. There was some understanding of what was going on. And obviously, in an agricultural sense, everyone knows that if you cut the branch off, you know, and it's like, hey, I'm going to get a, a branch, you know, or a piece of that you know, an olive tree or that piece of that grapevine, the branch of it, I'm just going to stick in a cup of water there in my house and I'm going to expect grapes to come out of it. It ain't going to happen. You know what I mean? It needs to stay connected to the vine, right? It needs to stay outside, connected to the vine, water the plant, and then you can get your, your, your fruit. You know, the same way like with a fruit tree or something like that. You can't just bring the branch, you know, home and say, hey, here, here you go, sweetheart, lifetime full of oranges. You know, it's not going to happen that way. 
and needs to stay connected. And so with this, and when Jesus is saying of himself that I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser, and he's speaking of the branches, he's speaking of the church, you know, us believers, we are the branches. He's talking about this constant connection, right? This constant connection. And guys, I think this is something that's very important for us to truly understand in our own Christian walk. In your own Christian life, you know, sometimes people just get this idea that, oh, you know, be, being a Christian, you know, or, or is, um, you know, that's what I do on Sundays. You know what I mean? And that's what I do on this day. You know what I mean? But on the other days, on Fridays, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just, I do my own thing, right? I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. It's like, no, that's not how it works. You see, Christianity, fellas, listen, Christianity You know, when Jesus died on the cross for our sin and we put our faith in what Jesus did on the cross, you know, yeah, that's what makes us a Christian, but it's not a religion. You see, it's not just something that we do on Sunday mornings or something that, you know, we think of from time to time, right? It's every single day. It's a lifestyle, right? It's a life. It's it's how I live my life. This is what I do. I'm sorry, man. This is what I do. This is how I live. I like to talk about Jesus, Right? I, I like to read his word. I like to have conversations. I like to, you know, be in prayer. You know, I like all these things. I love and enjoy the opportunity that I get to have with my wife and my children to, to raise them up in the in the ways of God. Is it easy? Oh, no way. I was gonna say, yeah, no way. It's not easy. There's not a person up here that can stand up and say, Oh man, yeah, that's easy. It's not easy. It is hard, it is difficult. Why is it hard? And why is it so difficult? It's real easy because we have skin on, right? We, we, we have flesh, right? And then we have the enticement of the things of this world that are constantly coming against us. So, so it's our flesh, it's the enticement of all this stuff in, that's around us in our world, you know? And so many of us, you know, probably, you know, most of us in this room have our world in our back pocket on our phones, right? It's easy access to everything. So there's temptation out there. But it's not just those things. We also have, because you've given your life to Christ, you also have a target on you. Right? You're also, you know, you're also, you know, one of the devil's most wanted because he wants to take you out. And if you are connected and you're constantly connected and you're depending, you see that connection for the branch, it speaks of a dependence on the vine. Okay? I, that, that branch is dependent on the vine to produce all of its sap and the nutrients so that it can do what it's been created to do, and that's produce grapes, right? That's produce the fruit. And so there's that dependence. And guys, as we, as we are, have that constant connection and that kind of a dependence, the enemy knows that. And if you're focused on that dependence in your life, the enemy is going to want to do everything and anything that he can to put a stop to that. So, he will, so whatever, he, whatever he can do to make you think that you don't need to be dependent on God any longer. You don't have to go to church every day. Just go on Sundays. You know what? You've been doing a whole lot of stuff, you know, for those people over there at the church. And it seems like they don't even appreciate you because, you know, they haven't even said thanks. You should just stop now and have an attitude about it. You know what? Yeah. You see the lies? You know, yeah, you're right, man. You know, hey, yeah, Charlie, I'm not going over there no more, man. You know, that's it. I'm done with it. You know, and then all of a sudden, you know what, just go once a month, you know, maybe. And then all of a sudden, you just go, you see the light. And then once you start doing that, and your dependence is no longer on every single day living after Jesus, the enemy is like, dude, okay, call yourself a Christian all you want because you are fruitless and you ain't making no difference at all. And he's going to leave you alone. And what does God do? God says he cuts it away. The fruitless. He cuts away. Now check it out. Listen, it says right here, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may be more, that there may be more fruit. You see, this speaks of this cultivation and care cultivation and care. Now, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not, I, I'm no kind of farmer. I, I just trip out on this. And so, uh, man, I'm kind of proud of myself because, you know, um, I got an avocado, right? And I liked that avocado. It was like really good. And so I got the, the, the seed, you know, the pit of the avocado. And I said, man, I'm going to try this trick that I did in second grade once where you just put some toothpicks in it and see if it grows. It worked. 
You know what I mean? It started growing, man. And now this avocado tree is probably, you know, probably about three and a half feet tall. It's about this tall now, right? Ain't no avocados on it, though. I know there's something more I got to do, right? But I've been planting this thing and watering it. And I've been looking at how do you got you to cut the top. You got to do all this kind of crazy stuff, you know, kind of just make it splice together. Anyways, maybe if you know what I'm talking about, you can help me afterwards. But here's the thing. You know, is, is that, you know, uh, I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, the cultivating. <laughs> I got all happy about my avocado tree. I forgot what I was talking about, man. <laughs> cultivating and caring for. You know, when that little seed was, was just beginning to sprout those little, the little, uh, you know, um, uh, roots and everything. Thank you. See, I don't even know what those are called. Those little things. <laughs> I was getting all excited, but I knew that I needed to be delicate and I needed to, I needed to care, right? It didn't, want to, it didn't have to have constant sunlight, but some sunlight, right? And, and uh, just fresh water and then, you know, changing it from the dirt and everything. Well, listen, I, I'm, not, I'm no farmer or nothing like that, but I do know that to have something fruitful like this if for a tree or for a vine, there is a, you need to cultivate and you need to care for it, right? And when we are saved... It's the same thing with us. That's what God sees in us. It's like, oh man, you're like that precious little seed that's about to begin to sprout and to dig roots. And how do we dig our roots, guys? Right? We dig our roots in the scriptures. Right? That's where we ought to be digging our roots. You know, some of us have our roots somewhere else right now. Listen to me. Some of you up in this room have roots somewhere else. And you think you're producing fruit, but it's just phony fruit. We're going to talk about that in a second. But our roots are being dug into God's word. And so when we get saved, you know, things begin to change in our lives. You know, there's this transformation that happens because, well, our roots are in, the, are in God's word, right? And we're growing and the Holy Spirit begins to cleanse our lives and, and our thought process begins to change. You know, we're not thinking how we used to think. I'm not thinking that, oh man, I got to come up tomorrow. I got to do this or I got to do that. You know, like in my case, that's what it was like. It's like my thoughts are like, oh Lord, you know, um, how am I going to serve you today? You know, these are some things that are before me today. I want to do my best in them. Lord, I need your help with this because I don't know what I'm doing. You see the reliance and the dependence upon God. You see, this begins to happen. And then as we grow those roots, what else happens? You know, well, there's, you know, branches start to grow. And when those branches grow and everything, and every, you know, vine dresser and farmer knows this, you got to begin to cut things back. You got to prune, right? This prune. Now, pruning, the purpose of pruning is to clean or cut back the branch so that it would be more fruitful, OK, now I've seen this before and, and you know, um, just and, and people cutting back their branches from the lemon tree or whatever like that, you know, and they they just cut them back. But their fruitless branches are tossed. <clears throat> excuse me. Their fruitless branches are tossed out because they're because they're not producing. They're not producing. They're not producing any fruit in them. And at times, those branches that aren't producing, sometimes they're carrying disease like fungus and all this other stuff. And so they don't want that kind of disease to catch on to the branches that are producing fruit. And so they get rid of them. Let's clean it up, right? They don't want this to infect the, uh, the, the, the other fruit or the branches that are producing fruit. You see, so we kind of get this idea when Jesus is speaking here to his disciples, he's talking to them agricultural things. He's talking to them about this vine where be things are beginning to really jive with them and their understanding, right? Now, this pruning that God does in people, because how many of you can say, man, God has pruned me back some, right? Can, okay, so those of you who ain't raising your hands, man, I'm going to pray that God comes with his big old shears and whoosh, whoosh, because you need to be pruned up, cleaned up, right? You see, the pruning that God does in his people, it should encourage us. It's not easy. It's not fun being cut back, right? Can you imagine if a tree was able to talk, you know? Like, like on the Wizard of Oz or something like that, those talking trees. Imagine, you know, you come, I'm going to prune you back. No, don't cut my, you know, I, that branch has been there for 40 years, yeah, it's been fruitless, too, for 40 years. Boom, you know what I mean? Those, those, those trees will be like, no, don't cut me, don't cut me. You see, because it's, there's painful in it. It's, you know, there's, uh, there's pain and there's discomfort that's involved with it. And you see, when God does this in his people, 
for, for those of us who have been pruned back and we know that God's hand was all upon it, right? This should encourage us that we would know that God cares enough about us to cause our lives to grow and be more fruitful. Again, because the pruning process, it ain't easy. It ain't easy. As I said, if a tree can talk, they would say, oh, no, please don't. This is not easy. This isn't fun, right? I don't want to be cut up. But here's the thing. We need to understand that when that happens, that's where the whole submission to the Lord and the yielding to, to the will of God. God, you are purposely cutting things back in my life and pruning my life. I know there's a reason. I can't understand it. I can't see it. I don't know what it is, but I'm trusting you that through this, something fruitful, something better is going to come out of it. And let me tell you something. That's God's plan for you. Not to make your life easier. Bummer, huh? <laughs> yeah, big bummer. But God's plan for you and for me is that our life would be better. Amen. Right? That your life would be better. That your life would be more fruitful with your loved ones in your homes and your workplace. You see, the pruning process isn't fun. The pruning is when God reveals to you Oftentimes, what does what the pruning look like, Tommy, for, you know, practically for us as Christians? Well, oftentimes the pruning process reveals your own flesh that needs to be dealt with. Those things that you haven't brought before the Lord and God has been waiting. Hey, when are you going to bring that to the Lord? When are you going to let me, you know, heal you from that or set you free from that little bondage of your, the will of your own flesh? And if it's not going to happen, well, you know what? God will come. He loves you enough to prune you, to cut you back, to reveal those areas of your flesh that needs to be dealt with. Or when you need to be cut back because of the worldliness that is in you. Not just your flesh, but the worldliness that is in you. I was talking with my wife. She actually dropped me off here earlier and we were just having this conversation about, you know, some people at her job and everything and, and what's going on. And, you know, she was just, and she prays for a lot of them and, you know, for all of them. Um, and, but for some of them, she has different prayers. I'm just, you know, anyways, you know, she's like, Lord, deal with them, right? But, you know, she was talking to me about this one, one uh, person she works with that's, you know, a Christian and says she goes to church, but her, her language Ah, oh, but Tommy, her language is like foul. It's so, it, it grieves me. You know, and we start talking about that worldliness. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm going to kind of talk about that. So you know what? God will deal with her. God will deal with the worldliness in her. But here's the thing, guys. I'm talking to you right now. Actually, God is talking to you right now. If there's worldliness that is in you, and you know what that's look, that looks like for you, whatever that worldliness, that worldliness might be, God will cut it back. Because he loves you and he wants your life to be fruitful. And so he will come with those shears and cut it back. Again, the purpose, because the main purpose of the pruning is to strengthen our faith, to strengthen your faith and build your character. The purpose for pruning in your life, Christian man, is to build your faith right and strengthen your character or strengthen your faith and build your character, however you want to put it, to build you up, to cause you to become more fruitful. You know, it's been, you know, said I was reading some things on, on pruning and, and, and all that stuff is that, you know, when, when those trees and they get pruned back and that next generation of fruit that comes out, it seems to always be sweeter and juicier. Sweeter and juicier. And so I was like, great. Now I have, a, I have an orange tree in my backyard. I haven't pruned that thing in about six years. <laughs> I, want, I said, no wonder it's sour oranges. Actually, we had a lot of rain, so it's not, they're not that sour. But, but the thing is, guys, when there's that pruning, the fruit that comes out is sweeter. It is bigger. It is more, it's juicier, you see. But it's the same thing even with us concerning our faith and our character. And we as men need to learn. Now here's, here's the thing. How well, is it as easy for us? No, you know what? We need, as men, we need to submit to that. See, because God's not gonna tie you down in these pews, right? I can't get up, God's gonna cut me up right now, you know? 
He's not going to do, he's not going to force us to do that. It was we, it's you as men learning how to submit to this process. Yield to the hand of God upon your life. God is dealing with me. Listen, the Bible says, the Bible says this, that God chastens those whom he loves. God prunes those that are producing fruit that he loves, that are serving him, that has that constant connection and dependence upon him. God is going to prune that individual. But here's the thing, fellas. We need to submit and surrender to the pruning process in our lives. Submission is something that not everybody likes to do, right? Submission in a man's mind is like, well, that's for the women. Our wives, it doesn't say wives submit, doesn't say nothing about men. You know, hey, listen, no, it does. Ephesians 5, 21 says, submit one to another in the fear of God, right? And, in, and that's in chapter 5 of Ephesians. As a matter of fact, in chapter 5 of Ephesians, in verse number 18, it says that, you know, not to be filled with wine, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And so the whole idea there is that you and I, that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit for this submission to take place. And if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, that pruning process, when God says, hey, I want your life to be more fruitful and I want to do a work in your life, would you allow me to cut these areas of your life up, the worldliness, the areas of your flesh, you know, to cut you back to strengthen your faith you know and if you're so prideful and not filled with the spirit say no man leave me alone God's gonna say wow all right I'll leave you alone but then your life then what it's not going to be as fruitful as your faith is not going to get built up and or nor your character right strengthened and you're going to wonder why what's going on in my life hey listen it's about submitting to the hand of God and being filled with the Holy Spirit to do so and then we see here that in verse number three you know, this pruning as, as Jesus is talking to them, right? He says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. I love, I love this verse, the word of God. The word of God, because of the word. Jesus said, because of the word I have spoken. He's speaking to his disciples. Because of the word I spoke to you, disciples, Peter, James, and John, Matthew, Right? Because of the word that I've been speaking to you, you are already clean. The power of God's word to cleanse us, right? To wash us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our initial cleansing, okay? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, that initial cleansing. When you hear the word of God, that gospel, that gospel message that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, and you say, God, Jesus, forgive me, boom, that initial cleansing, that is it. It is done, right? In the same way, when, when, when Jesus, in chapter number 13 of this same gospel, and Jesus says or to, to the guys, hey, I'm going to wash your feet. But what does Peter say? Oh, no, Lord, you can't wash my feet. You know, and then Jesus, he say, hey, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part with me. You know, and they, it's like, okay, well, take me a bath. Right. And Jesus goes on to say, you know, it's, it's, it's not your whole body. I don't need to wash your whole body. It's just your feet. In other words, hey, listen, you need, there's, there's this constant cleansing that we need to go through in life because we're going through this world that's infected with sin. Right. And we pick up so many different things in this world. And so when Jesus here, he says, uh, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He's speaking of that initial cleansing of, of the word of God. God's word is that cleansing agent in our lives. But it's not just the initial cleansing. It's also the continual cleansing of God's word in our life. Many of us understand if we know that verse you know, um, there in Ephesians where it says that, um, you know, wives submit. Okay, I'll get that one out of the way, right? I already said that. Some of you are smiling. Yeah, right on. Jesus. You know, hey, listen, but it says to, for husbands, husbands to, to wash the, your wives with the cleansing of the word, right? With the washing of the word. Speaking that word. And it doesn't only, and there in that context, it's not just that one that one, uh, the gospel, the logos word, right? The, it, it's, a, it's that rhema word, that, that one specific word spoken perfect in, in, in that perfect timing, right? Speaking love, but it's just the washing with the word, that continual washing. And we all need God's word to continue to wash us and to cleanse us. God's word daily in our lives keeps us in a place of purity. It does. 
It does, that continual, uh, you know, just going to God's word. I love it how it says in Psalm 119, turn there if you would in your Bibles, because I want to make sure that you have this underlined or highlighted in your Bibles. Psalm 119 there in verse number nine. Psalm 119, verse number nine. When you're there, say amen. 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 All right. Praise God. Listen, Psalm 119, verse number nine. Some of you may have heard this verse and you know it. But if you have, don't have an underline in your Bible, make sure it's underlined. It says here, the psalmist writes, how can a young man cleanse his way? How can a young man cleanse his way? And it says right there, by taking heed to the word of God. I love that. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the word of God. By being in constant connection with God through his word. By not saying, oh, I don't need the Bible, but I need God's word. By saying, I need God's word and I need the holiness of his word in my life. God's word is that continual cleansing agent in our life right now, guys. Right now, whether you believe it or not, God's word is working. There's power in his word. These aren't just words like from a phone book. This is the book, God's book, the holy word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Not one word will come back void, the Bible tells us, and is doing its work right now in us, in you. Whether you believe it or not, it is. It's his cleansing agent, and that's how powerful God's word is. And so God says and he tells the disciples, Jesus does, you know, he, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And I look at verses four and five, and he says, abide in me. Jesus says this, I love it. He says, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I love this. Because what really what Jesus is saying here is that this is not a one-sided type of a relationship. It's not just me, you know, doing everything. This is a, this is a two-way road right here. This is a you and I thing. Me and you and you and me. This is it. I don't know. It like, sounds like an oldie song or something like that. <laughs> Find that in Art LeBeau somewhere. I don't know. But listen, this is not a one-sided relationship as you see that right there in verse number four. He says, abide in me and I in, and I in you. You see, God can be in your life. Yes, true. God can be in your life. But here's the question. Are you in God's? Man, Christian man here in Whittier. God can be in your life, but are you in God's? Are you associating, are you having this dependence and this connection? Are you abiding in him? You see, abiding, guys, is a personal desire. Abiding in Jesus Christ, abiding in God, is a personal desire. God doesn't make us or he doesn't force us. You see, a lot of men make the decision it seems to let their wives and families get into God deeply. Hey, well, you know, I go to church from time. I believe in God, you know, but my wife, man, she goes all the time. She's, she's the one who prays for dinner. She's the one who talks about the Bible because she knows more about it. You know, I, I believe in God, though. You know, God's in me, you know, because I put faith in, my, in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Right. But there's many men in the church. And I'm so glad to see you because I wouldn't say that about you. You're here. But there are many men that that maybe aren't here that you maybe they should be here. But they're probably saying, well, my wife is going to go to church tomorrow. She can tell me all about it because I'm going to watch the game. And too many men settle for that in life. Right. And they settle for just allowing their families to go and, and get into God without them. Right? Like it's okay or something. And because of it, the result of that, men are okay, it seems to, with another man. And watch this. Listen, now I want you guys to understand. Because there's a lot of temptation out there for us here. Because there's going to be more events like this. There's more opportunities. But it's not just men's events. It's Sunday mornings. It's throughout the week. It's at home, praying with your wife and sowing and, you know, and just ministering to your wife, ministering to your children, ministering to, ministering to the people that you're around, the people that you love. 
See, and sometimes men get too comfortable and they say, you know what, I, I'm satisfied. You know, I'm okay with another man satisfying the spiritual needs of the people that I love. You know, and for us as men, we should say, no, no, no. And that's my, that's, that's my privilege. I love to take my wife to go to church and so we can listen together and get built up together and we can have conversations. And when my wife has those moments and, or my family or people that I love have those moments that, of need, I can give to them as much as I possibly can. I don't want, I don't want my family to be satisfied spiritually by some other person. You know, I, I, want, I want that to be me. And I hope that's our desire. And guys, where does that desire develop in our lives? It develops as you abide in Christ. It, it develops as you stay connected to Jesus. You see? Man, if you're not knowing God and, and you're not abiding in him or in his grace or in his love or in his truth, you're going to miss out on the opportunity you're going to miss out on that opportunity to be fruitful and to grow with your families. You are. And I don't think any of us want that. Because there's going to become a time in life when life is all going to be done. And there you are going to be on that bed or be in that chair, wherever you might be. And I know for me, because I've heard this before, my only, my only thought that I have is like, man, I want to make the most of Jesus for my family. I want to make the most of Christ in my marriage. I want to make the most of God for the people that I love. Because that's what's going to matter, right? And also, God, how you're going to use me, however that might, might look. And you might say, well, yeah, Tommy, well, you're a pastor, man. you got a church, and that should be your job. No, that's our job as Christians. Me being a pastor is simply a calling that God has put in my life. Trust me, I, that was the furthest thing from my mind. You know what I mean? Sure, God, you sure you wanted me to be a pastor? You know, I'm, I'm an ex-con, you know. God says, yes. See, it's our job, it's our opportunity, it's our blessing to do that. And we can't, I don't want you to miss out on that opportunity. And the, and the way that you will is by staying disconnected, by not abiding. And verse number five, as I close, Jesus says, I am the vine. I am the vine and you are the branches and he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. I love it. See, he didn't stop there though. Imagine if he did. All right, cool. He goes on to say, because but for without me, you can do nothing. See, the plan for the Christian life, the plan for the Christian man, the plan for the believer in Jesus Christ, no matter what the age, what the gender, what kind of a background he or she comes from, the plan for the Christian life is to be fruitful. That's it. Okay? To be fruitful. A life of, and what does that mean? To be fruitful. Does that mean there's going to be like fruit popping out of me? No. It means your character and your faith. It means that you're going to live your life with meaning and purpose in life. Yes, That's what it's going to mean. And the purpose... For us, well, look at the purpose of the, ooh, that was pretty loud. Look at the purpose for the, you know, just the, my orange tree in the backyard. The purpose for my orange tree is not to produce avocados. It's to produce oranges, right? And that's what it does. It's fully grown and that's what it does. It just produces oranges, Right? And how does that happen? You're never going to see a tree or a vine or anything that produces fruit struggle. You know, hey, what's wrong with your tree in the backyard, man? It looks like it's freaking out. Ah, uh -huh, don't worry, man. It's just struggling. It's just stressing out right now because it can't pop out another orange. You know, that would be a trip. You know, it's not going to happen that way. It just genuinely, naturally pops out these oranges without any kind of effort. There's no struggle and there's no stress involved in producing the fruit. And you know what? The same is with us as Christians. When you are abiding in Christ, when you're staying connected to God, 
right? That constant connection and that dependence on Jesus to get all those spiritual nutrients in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, in your mind, washing you and cleansing you. I am telling you, man, you're not going to wake up that morning and say, man, I'm going to stress out because I really got to be a good Christian today. You know, I want to, nah, man, that's, that's phony fruit. That's fake fruit. That's like the fruit that you have in a prop. I remember my aunt, my Aunt Vicky, she's with Jesus now. I remember back when I was a young kid, she would always have this fruit basket right there with plastic fruit, you know? And it's like plastic banana, the plastic grapes, you know, they're, they're those purple ones. You guys know what I'm talking about. You see what I'm saying? Back in the day, right? I remember just getting, she got mad at me, my brother, because we poked all the grapes off, you know? <laughs> just kind of just let them sit there, you know? But, but you know, there is no juice yet. They looked real. You know, that banana looked real, but it wasn't real. It was fake. It was phony fruit. You see? And as we stay connected, you're not going to have to stress out to, to produce fruit because there are people, guys, check this out. There are people in the church that do that, but that's all phony fruit. It's fake fruit. It's not lasting fruit. You see? For us as Christian men, so we need to stay connected. And as you stay connected, you will not struggle. You will not stress or have this effort to be fruitful. It's just going to happen. You're just going to wake up and say, man, I'm going to work. And all of a sudden, your life is just going to be fruitful. Your character and your faith is going to be built up. You're not trying to make it happen. It just is happening. Amen. Amen. I love that. It's just, I don't know. Hey, Tommy, how'd you do that? I don't know, man. I'm just, it just happens. It's just the Lord. It's God working in us. You see, a person not abiding, wanting to bear that fruit, though, as I said, is just going to produce phony fruit. And unfortunately, there are people in the church that are like that. Beware of them. The man abiding is producing fruit naturally. And this fruit is revealed in our character. But not only is the fruit revealed in our character but it's also revealed, I truly believe, in reproduction, right? Because most fruit has seeds, right? And you see, as you're living that life, you're making a difference in other people's lives because that seed that is being planted. Remember this, guys. The, the part of verse number five I asked you to underline, what Jesus says is straight up. He's, this is not vague. This is not like, what does Jesus kind of really mean right here? He's being straight up and he's telling the, the disciples, the followers of, of, of Jesus. He says, I want you to know, without me, you could do nothing. Without me, you could do nothing. Without me, it's phony fruit. Without me, it's just fruit like a prop. That's all it is. Without me, you could do nothing. Nothing. All of your efforts of whatever it is that you try to do will have no eternal value. You see, and God wants to bless your life so much that your life will have eternal value. Not just for you, but for other people around you. You have one life, it'll soon be passed. Only that which is done for Christ will last. Fellas, are you abiding are you receiving all the nourishment and nutrients that Jesus offers for your life to be fruitful? Are you doing that? I hope so. Or are you finding yourself this, this evening, tonight, empty? Like, man, I, I'm like that fake fruit. Or you know, there's been a lot of things in my life. Or maybe you're saying, you know what, I, I feel these things that God has wanted to do in my life, but you know, I, just don't, I don't want him to prune me back. I don't want him to expose me. You see, when things get pruned back, you're exposed, right? You get that tree gets exposed. Like, oh, that's what the tree really looks like on the inside right there. You see, there's many Christians, and perhaps there's some of you even here today where God just wants to prune you back. But you need to submit. And you're fearful of what might be exposed. If that's what's going on in your life, I want to tell you right here, right now, so what? God wants to do this in your life for a purpose, for your life to be fruitful. Amen? Amen. Father, Lord, we love you. And we are so grateful and blessed for your holiness, for your word, for your truth. Lord, I pray that tonight... As we just end this time, Lord, in your word, 
as we end this time as our, in our fellowship with you, as we end this time, as, we, as we're continuing to worship you, Lord, not only in song, but in word and now through prayer, we are worshiping you, Lord. And we pray that you would do that work in us. Fellas, guys, listen, if, if, if you're in here tonight and you feel that God wants to prune you back, he wants to clean up some areas and cut back some areas of your life. Right now, whomever you are, I want to ask you to stand to your feet. Whoever you are. Tonight's the night. This is the day. If tonight, God's word has been convicting you because the fruit that you've been trying to produce has been all on your own efforts. And God is pointing out to you, hey, listen, that's not of me. That's, that's fake and phony fruit. I want to encourage you to stand up too. Just confess of that, repent of it, and it's okay. We've all been there. I know I have. Father, for the men that are standing to their feet tonight, Lord, whether they're being pruned back, cut back, Lord, or, or you're, you're doing a work in their lives and in their hearts by exposing what you truly want to do, what, how you want their, their life to be fruitful and not on their way, but on your ways that will be full I pray that you'd minister to them, Father. For the men that need forgiveness, I pray that they would confess and repent of their sin here tonight. For the men that are just being resistant to you working in them, Father, I pray that they would say, okay, Lord, I yield and I surrender to you. I give you all. Father, I pray you'd bless them.